Okay, so we've seen that the love on trial for the average person, Christian, is going to be a big fat zero. That's the one of two ends that everybody's going to end up having as a result. There are only two ends. There's nothing in the middle. You're either going to die a winner, that's the Bible's term for it in Revelation, or you're going to die a loser. My pastor stressed that over and over and over when he was exegeting the book of Revelation, which he did seven times a week for four years. Each class was new because he was exegeting the whole book. And one of the reasons why I ended up having to spend so much time documenting the rapture, which led to the doctrine of how God orchestrates time that nobody else knows. One of the reasons I had to do that was because I got bored with the rapture doctrine and the whole kingship thing back in the 1981 through 85 when I first learned it. Now, if God's going to punish me that much, I mean, punishment is always a blessing with God, okay? If he's going to punish me that much for being bored, what do you think he's going to do to the people who don't even bother to learn those doctrines? Which is 99% of Christendom. And I say 99%, and that's not an exaggeration, because um, most of the world is still Catholic or Calvinist or Reform or some other version of replacement theology, which denies... Um, the validity of pre-trib rapture. They deny it because they think that the Jew lost his place in history replaced by church. And Calvin was particularly vociferous about this, as was Luther. The whole doctrine of replacement theology is based on anti-Semitism. So if I got so punished being, what do you want to call it, um, not exactly pro, but accepting, believing, of the pre-trib rapture doctrine, the whole kingship thing that goes with it. Because they're all part and parcel of the same thing. If I got so punished, what do you think is going to happen to the other Christians? It's not good. Nobody matures in the spiritual life who doesn't fully understand and believe in pre-trib rapture and the kingship doctrine. Now, fortunately, there are a good many churches out there, usually Baptist, but not necessarily, who hold to pre-trib rapture. They don't teach it very well. They don't teach it in any detail, but at least they know something of both doctrines. So, their congregations might grow. Depends on what else they're teaching. I don't have the excuse that many will have of they're guilty of not believing in the doctrine and they're guilty of not seeking the teaching of the doctrine, but they're not guilty of having known the doctrine and then rejected it. You can't be guilty of rejecting something that you didn't learn. They will be guilty in a different way, but not that way. I would be guilty in that way if I don't finish the course. Because this is what upsets me the most about it, all the doctrine in the Bible, the whole kingship thing. So I'm going to combine the flip side of my own problem with what happens if a person finishes the course. Because the flip side to episode 12A1 was, okay, what's the average vote going to be? And the average vote by the average Christian is going to be flunk. Zero. You didn't get out of the starting line. You don't have any kingship. You don't have any rewards. Yeah, you're saved. And yeah, it's forever. But that's it. Nothing else. By contrast, the flip side, the winner, as the book of Revelation calls it, the winner will be crowned king. 
Now there will be, as I had said in the you know twelve a one, there will be a limited number of kings. Very limited number, unless God chooses to adopt a sort of city-state mode for what He calls kings. I mean, in the Old Testament, um, a guy would be called a king, and his place, the the place he was king of, would be called a country. But it was really a city, maybe of a million inhabitants. In those days, that meant a lot because life was cheap. Life was cheap and you had a huge divergence between the highest and the lowest in those days. But for the huge divergence is nothing like the divergence it is now. Because technology was limited. So even a king didn't have air conditioning. If you hear noise in the background, that's what you're hearing. Even a king didn't have air conditioning, didn't have proper heat. He didn't have much in the way of clothing or other kinds of comforts, creature comforts. If you want to try to get some kind of handle on what it was like in the ancient world to be a king, I mean, there were exceptions. But generally speaking, king of a city-state was kind of like the, the king thing that you see in Game of Thrones. That, that was your pretty typical king. Whoops. Where the... Sorry. I dropped my recorder. Where the king in question is really very little, you know, different from his inhabitants. He's got the authority, and he can say, you know, kill this person and that person will be killed. But the quality of his life really isn't much better than those that he rules. It was still considered a huge divergence. It's just that the total ability to diverge in those days was not like now. I mean, it would take you a week to make a tunic to wear because it had to be hand sewn. And you had to first get the wool off the sheep, and then you had to spin the wool into thread, and then you'd have to spin the thread into, weave the thread into a, an outfit. And that outfit was really just, you know, like what you would call a sleep shirt. Okay, a lot of kingdoms in the old times were very poor. So the king was way richer than everybody else and pretty much owned the people, but the quality of his life really wasn't that much better. And he lived by fighting. And everybody lived by fighting. Now, I took that big digression because I'm trying to give you a sense of when it says that we get crowned kings if we mature in Christ. How big of a kingdom is that? Is it kingdom like kingdom meant in the Old Testament, which was, you know, over a pretty limited populace compared to today's standards? Or is it more of the glamorous variety that we associate with kingship improperly? Because those were really empires, not kingdoms. Like Egypt, like Nebuchadnezzar, like Assyria, like the Hittite Empire like the Medes and the Persians, like the Greeks, eventually the Greeks. Actually, the Greeks represent both sides of the coin. Most Greek city-states were really small, really poor, and really belligerent. That's why they were belligerent. Then when Athens finally kind of... Athens and Sparta fought a lot. And when Athens sort of became had honcho. They found a silver mine and they didn't have to work. So then they sort of developed into an empire. But unless you're talking empire in the Old Testament, you're not talking about a lot of wealth. Okay? Compared to what we consider kingship to me. It was very rustic. So if God follows the rustic standards, well then, 
assuming I finish the course and I get crowned, I might be king over a million people. It might be 60 million, which is what I posited in my web pages, Roughly the size of France. Because there's some kind of balance in numbers. How intimate does God want the kingdoms to be? Does he want them to be intimate? If, if so, then you're looking at a popul an average population size, which is a lot like Europe. I mean, the European countries have been, you know, their, bo their borders were fought over for hundreds of years, but they've more or less been stable for a couple of hundred years. Border skirmishes a lot. But, you know, your average size country in Europe is somewhere around 60 million people. All right, is that the size that he has in mind? Or is he talking empire like Rome? And I would imagine that the kings are not equal. So their populations that they rule are not equal. The kind of lands they rule are not equal. Okay? But if you're looking at intimacy, 60 million is about as big as you want to go. That, that keeps the king in touch with all of his subjects. And even then it's a little dicey. But France is a pretty intimate country. And that's why I picked France as an example. Um, if I make it. That's basically the idea. I mature in Christ by doing my menial things. And I'm going to be covering that a lot for the balance of the audio. I mature in Christ by doing menial things, in my particular case. And as a result of that, the kinds of skills I needed to learn, somewhat akin to David being a shepherd, the kinds of skills I need to learn can be applied to the menial things because it's the thought that counts, not what you're physically doing with your hands particularly. And therefore, the thought pattern of Christ gets developed in me, and therefore I will be um, in a position where I have the maturity in my soul to rule. Now, every Christian has his own like hit, hit, hit key points, hitching points, objections, oppositions to specifics in the Bible. My particular one is the idea of having charge over other people. I don't like it for two reasons. First and foremost, I don't like the status. That bugs me. I don't like the idea of having authority, formal authority, over other human beings. I actually just don't like the idea of having authority over people at all. I, I would prefer to be an advisor. I would prefer to be, you know, an independent. I say something, I explain why it's right, and then I want the other person to make up his own mind. The idea of me ordering somebody to do something, it's not that I'm incapable of it, but I hate doing it. I hate being harsh with people. I hate ordering people. And of course, we're not going to be harsh in the eternal state. But kings give orders. That's their job. And the benefit of a good ruler is that the orders he gives you are, are like orders you really want to carry out. You're hoping he'll give you those orders. And that's what makes heaven heaven. Okay? So my first objection to God about all this, the status... Um, th there's no getting around it. The other people didn't want to learn the head of Christ, so they can't be heads in the eternal state. It's that simple. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. The head of Christ. That's what he means. It's introduced by a Greek word, hupobali, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. He's making a pun on what he just said about the body of Christ. So now he's going to talk about the head. The head of Christ, of course, is scripture. And even the, your average Calvinist understands that 1 Corinthians 13 is about the completion of canon. It's not love as an emotion. It's certainly not human love. 
And the Greek word agape never means human love. There's different Greek words for that. But of course, you know, your typical unschooled Christian will, you know, think in terms of emotional human love. And the emotion of love is not even love in humans. But, you know, it goes on being misunderstood generation after generation because nobody wants to study it. That's the problem. So you got all these emotional types that spent their life with rah-rah Jesus and ritual and works and all that. And since they didn't finish the course, they didn't pass love on trial, those who do mature in the head of Christ do pass love on trial, which is what Paul's talking about, and they rule. The status, this is what counters my objection to God about this, the status is necessary for the sake of the body. He reminds me of that all the time. The body needs it. The head is not the body. The head needs the body as much as the body needs the head. And there's a little little song about that in Timothy. Where the head says he will never deny himself. That's how it ends, the little song. Okay. But the head is... Everything about the head is exactly the opposite of the body. So what appeals to the head is just the opposite of what appeals to the body. Now the objection is answered because I'm training to be a head. I am more like a head than I am like a body because everything with the body I just don't even want to have anything to do with it. It's just everything about the body is annoying to me. And that's the way it's supposed to be in the developmental process. I'm not supposed to like being in the body. Paul complained about it a lot. I want to get out of here. I want to be dead yesterday. I don't want to be down here. I want to go home. Because the body is too low. Everything about it is too low, too retarded, too slow, too everything. Forget it. Okay, well, when you're developing into a head, that's the kind of attitude and standards that are germane to the head. In other words, it's not wrong to have that standard. What's wrong is to, how do you want to call it? What's wrong is to say that the body can't be made good on. See, the whole point, Christ is ahead, or the body, he makes good on us. The standards of the body are repugnant to the head. They should be. The head can't be a head without those standards. In other words, a king is not a good king if he's all hung up on his body. If I'm all hung up on my body, then I would misuse the kingship status to please the body. The king has to be above all that. And the Queen of England is a great example of this standard of being above it. You have the power, you have the respect, you have the approval, you have the goodies, and you aren't supposed to care about them for yourself. They don't mean anything to you. They aren't supposed to mean anything to you. The only reason to want any bodily stuff is so that you can do for your kingdom. And that's exactly what she does with everything she has. I mean, she was, what, 25 when she ascended the throne, Queen Elizabeth? And she made her little speech, I'm going to devote everything I am and have to my country. And she's done just that. She sacrificed more than anybody I know. I mean, I can't really say that for sure, but I've studied a lot of the, you know, the royal lives in history. 
and and she sacrificed more than anybody I can tell has sacrificed. That's probably not true, because you know I don't know all there is to know about the others too. But I know a lot, and she's really given up a lot, and that's what it should be. So this believer king in training has got to learn to want to do that and part of me does and part of me doesn't want to touch it because it's so repugnant yeah I should regard it as repugnant but not so much that I won't as it were give my all to it this is not sacrificing even though it has that behavior it has in a way that effect True love is where you want to do it. And if you want to do it, then it's not a sacrifice to you. My big argument with God is, well, how am I going to want to do this? Why do you want to do it? Because God's doing it. He's given his all to us. That doesn't seem very godlike. But this is what true kingship is. You give everything you've got to your kingdom. Christ the head gives everything he is and has to the body. So if I'm going to finish growing up in him, i got to learn to do the same thing. And just like you, I have a body of stuff that I own, that I have charge over, that I need to deal with every day. And I have to learn to love it. And that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to love something when it's attractive to you. It's not easy when it's not attractive to you. And one of the things that growing up in Christ does to you is it renders everything but God unattractive. I have faith in God alone. And I don't have any faith in anything else. I have a desire to know Him alone. And I really don't have a desire for anything else. Maybe peanut butter. So the idea of having to be in this body and do anything at all, I don't care how pleasant, it's not worth my time. I have to grow past that. So it's a kind of cross. And this is a thing that I started to mention, you know, back in episode 7 and 8 is that you end up, God pits you against your worst nightmare. And he aims to turn it into your dream come true. He, he marries both of them. And he did that to every single hero in the Bible. We're supposed to look at those heroes and, and recognize that the parallel, the stories in their lives, are the parallels for our own. We're not supposed to put them on some other plane than ourselves. And say, well, that's true of them, but I'm not good enough. That'll never be true of me. No, they were just ordinary people. They were ordinary people in some cases with really big hang-ups. You know, David had a problem with the ladies. Abraham had a, had a fear problem because his wife was so gorgeous. Gideon, of course, had a problem with the ladies and practically everything else. He didn't end up well, though. Moses had a problem with uh, prosperity, actually. I mean, well, he also had a problem that's somewhat akin to the one that I've got about low and slow. He was very quick-minded. And it was hard for him when others weren't. He was very quick-minded and very quick-tempered. I guess I share those two. But see, these were all ordinary people. And the story in the Bible is how God takes the ordinary person and turns them into an extraordinary person. No matter where you are right now, God can do all that to you. Make you a hero bigger than the Old Testament. Bigger than. Truthfully. Okay, Christ wasn't kidding when he said, Greater things than these shall you do. When he compared his miracles and then talked to the apostles, saying that his miracles that he did were nothing compared to the plan for our lives. Yeah. 
And you say, well, but that's a divine miracle. Honey, it's a bigger divine miracle that God changed you into his son's thinking. Much bigger divine miracle. Christ called, called it true riches. So the testimony of love on trial for the believer who gets crowned is that his dream come true and his worst nightmare merged and he went through it to the end. For Paul, the dream come true was to be able to save Israel. His worst nightmare was to have to go to the Gentiles. He learned to love going to the Gentiles and God basically prohibited him from going to the Jews and that upset Paul so much that starting at the end of uh, Romans 15 which is parallel to Acts 17, 21 18 through 21, 22 um, Paul couldn't tolerate the fact that he wasn't allowed by God explicitly to witness to his fellow Jews and, and you know all this because Paul confesses it in Acts 22 he wasn't allowed to do what he did and he starts gerrymandering God's will in Romans 15. My pastor called this Paul's Fall. It's Lesson 1541 and following in the 1992 Spiritual Dynamics series that runs for about 3-4 months. So it's about, I don't know, um, 120 lessons, something like that. This was Paul's big, big marriage problem. His worst nightmare was going to the Gentiles because he's a Jew, legalistic Jew as that. And he loved Judaism. And that was his worst nightmare was to go to the Gentiles. And his dream come true would have been to evangelize the Jews. Well, the thing is, God gave Paul what he wanted as his dream come true via the Gentiles. And you can tell Paul figuring that out. In the, in the prison epistles, in particular Ephesians and, and Philippians. Um, Romans, he, he sort of knew it. He, he showed it in Romans 9 through 11. But um, the point is that God marries your dream come true, worst nightmare, okay? So applying that to myself, because everybody's an ordinary person turned into an extraordinary person, so I'm not exempted. My worst nightmare is this whole status thing. And what answers the objection is, well, the body needs a head. He, he, that's what he uses on me the most to get me through the day. The body needs it. Isaiah 54, 1 and the body needs it are the two things that he recalls to my mind the most. And then that answers the status question. And why do I dislike that status? I don't know. I just don't. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like having status over other people. Okay? I just don't. Makes me feel separated from them. Or, I don't know. I just don't like it. The second thing about it, of course, is giving orders. Well, that's answered by the fact that in the eternal state, the king giving orders is what everybody wants. They want it down here, too, but whatever the orders are that the king gives, the people always find something against it because we got sin natures down here. The next thing I don't like about the eternal state and kingship, I mean, really, th this is my true idea of hell, is parenting. I don't have a particular desire or appreciation or enjoyment of, how do you want to call it? Having to discuss something on a very elemental level over and over and over and over again. I like the nurturing part of parenting. I care about the people a lot. I mean, give my life for them kind of amount. Easily. But obviously that's not wholly true because the most important thing you can do as a parent is be willing to repeat the elemental, the basic, over and over and over because a child has to hear it over and over and over. It does not sink in. 
I'm trying to do that with these audios. I'm trying to repeat myself a lot. And I remember my pastor talking about that quite frequently. Where he says, I'm going to keep on repeating until you got it coming out of your ears. And he hated repeating. But it's necessary to inculcate. That's all advertising is based on this. You can't see an ad once and remember the product. You have to see it 60 times, 70 times, 1,000 times before you'll remember the product. The same thing is true of any other kind of learning. Because the body, here's where the body ties in, the body doesn't learn. I don't know if you notice this about your own body. But you might sit in Bible class, and this particularly happens with a sin you recognize. You commit a sin you know is wrong, and afterwards it's like, why did I do that? I know better than that. This is Romans 7. Paul's saying the same thing. And here he had all that Bible doctrine, and yet he's talking the same way. I know what's good and right and true, and I believe in it. So why do I find myself doing the opposite? And Paul ends up concluding at the end of the chapter, oh, well, it's the sin nature. Well, that's part of it. The sin nature is always bucking everything. But the bottom line is, is your body, your body isn't really you. It's a house. It's a dead thing. In other words, you have a computer. You have to do all kinds of things to maintain that computer. And five minutes after you've done the thing, you might have to do it again. Or the next day. I mean, you always have to defrag. You always have to back up. You always have to do the same things over and over. Your body needs to eat. Some people can get by with one meal a day. Others, they have to eat at least three times a day. Or they faint. You have to breathe every, every you know, once every 30 seconds. The breath you took 30 seconds ago is gone now and you got to do it again. The body can't retain anything. It's like a dead battery. I don't know if you've ever been in a car when the battery died. But if you had somebody come out, they jumped the battery, and that battery was only good once you started the car with the battery jumper cables. That was only good until you could drive to the local station, unless somebody told you. The battery would be dead again the minute you turn the car off. That's the way your body is. It's dead. Dead in Adam, for, to be specific. Romans 5.12. The body is not you. So, in order for you to learn anything, since that's an interaction of soul and brain, your soul learns a whole lot faster and better and more than your body can process. So it's a bottleneck. Your brain has to be imprinted with the information. And printing it once, hearing it once, ain't going to do it. It's got to go over and over and over and over and over and over. The most important part of you is a soul-to-brain interface. And without repetition, there's no imprinting. Therefore, you won't remember, therefore, you won't understand, therefore, you won't learn, therefore, it'll be unfamiliar. I mean, it is a lot like exercise for the body. And as you know, exercise for the body has to be done over and over and over every day. Any athlete will tell you he's got to practice his athletic stuff a good three to six hours a day. And the minute he stops, even within a week, he's lost a lot of his skill. It's noticeable. A ballet dancer, a surgeon, anybody who does has to do a lot of body to mind the body coordination. They can't even afford to go a week without. All right, and they'll notice it. Dancer. Well, it's much more true in the spiritual life. Much, much more true. And if I go a day or two, or even longer, without studying the Greek and Hebrew, I start to forget it. And I've been doing it almost every day for, what, I'm 60 now, so, what, 40, 40 years. But I'll start to forget it. 
that's just the problem. The body's a dead battery. Now, that's one of the big reasons why it's pass fail in the Christian life. One of the big reasons why, if you want to finish the course, you pretty much have to start earlier. You have to get real intense the later you start. It's never too late to get somewhere. And God might grant you extra years of life, like he did to Hezekiah, 15 years. But, you've got to keep at it. So, if I finish the course, the one who finishes the course has kept at it, day in, day out, day in, day out. Even through his worst nightmare and his dream come true being joined together. Which for me, as far as an actual function, is parenting. Always forever having to tend to the low, the slow, the menial. And a king has to do an, uh, an enormous amount of low, slow, and menial. Because his life is more largely ceremonial. It has to be ceremonial. Because the hoi polloi, the populace, the common people, that's all they understand. They need the pageantry. They need the king to look rich and, you know, comfortable and grand. That's their way of vicariously enjoying high status. And then they feel better if they're working for a king who's like that. They need all that show. They really do. And if you doubt it, just look at how much we praise ancient Egypt and all the other civilizations. We go after their buildings, their splendor, the mummy masks. We're all ogling their goodies. And we say it was a great kingdom because of all these great buildings and these great baubles that the kings had. That wasn't what made those kingdoms great. But a poor person, poor in thinking, can't understand what really made the kingdoms great. What makes any kingdom or any person or any organization great is the thinking. But there's no glamour to that. So your average Joe Blow, he only sees the glitter. And that to him is what greatness means. So in the eternal state, and this is one of the, the third thing about it that I hate, is that if I end up being a king, I have to suffer, oh, meaning allow in the ancient King James sense, I have to suffer, allow, permit, living a gaudy life. Because the people are going to need that to tie to Christ. They can't tie to him in their thinking because they didn't learn it down here. To me, the only reason to want heaven is because of the way he thinks. I don't want the rest of it. The rest of it's ugly to me. His thinking is beautiful and everything else, frankly, is boring or ugly. I don't want anything. Just see him, period. No glamour. I could be on a desert island. You could put me in a dungeon. I really don't care. So long as I know he's thinking, that's happiness. That's heaven to me. Right now. And forever. Well, but, you know, he's king. Over people. And the people need all that glitz and glitter. I can't stand it. I, I can't stand the goodies that go with wealth. And convenience, yes. Time saving, yes. But all the rest of it? No. It's just, you know, more hassle. You know, I just assumed somebody else had all that glitter and glamour. I don't want it. I don't like it. It's boring. Okay, but the people need that. So you see, he's answered all my objections to him on all counts. So I have no excuse for not getting there. Now the things I like about parenting are that the people will actually come to know him better each day. Through whatever it is that my kingdom, that my policy I end up setting. I have no idea what that's going to be at this point. I have to be dead before I'll know. 
but I practice what's going to become that policy on everything I own now, on all my interactions with people now. I practice being nice, I practice being stern, not that you have to really be stern in the eternal state, but you have to be definitive, authoritative. I practice being, you know, cheerleader, which is my default personality. I'd rather cheer somebody on than tell them what to do. I practice being pedantic and scholarly. In the eternal state, well, scholarly is where it's at, baby. Everybody's going to want to know every jot and tittle about the Hebrew and Greek then. Well, that'll be thrilling. For me, that's the most thrilling part of it. So I get to talk about him and all the technicalities of scripture. It's just gorgeous. That's, you know, rubies and precious stones and the glitter and glamour to me is looking at those little itsy bits of the grammar. Subjective and objective genitive. Oh, I drool over that stuff. I'd rather have that than a thousand diamonds on my fingers. In fact, if I had a thousand diamonds on my fingers, I'd be complaining about the weight. And how I can't move my fingers and I'm afraid of getting them dirty. But subjective and objective genitive? Oh, honey. There's no amount of wealth on the planet that's as gorgeous as that. The whole thinking of God is encapsulated in the Greek grammar use of subjective, objective genitive, and plenary genitive. I'm totally in, enamored of it. In awe. Okay, but then as king I get to do that. I get to show them all that stuff. And they'll be thrilled to learn it then. That's heaven. Imagine the thing nobody wants to learn down here. The Greek geek stuff. The Hebrew geek stuff. Everybody mouths it to make themselves feel important and studious. But nobody actually cares or understands. Well, not exactly nobody. But, you know, one out of a million Christians actually cares about this stuff. And everybody's going to want to know that stuff in heaven. Because of what it reveals about Christ. Well then that's heaven for me, isn't it? So where do I get off being so arrogant that I object to this kingship status thing? What's wrong with it? I have no excuse. So I'm supposed to practice on everything I own now and all the people I know now as if I were their ruler now. Or I won't finish the course. And that means I'll be farther away from Christ. Like most Christians will be. They'll be very distant from Christ. They'll be lucky to see him once every thousand years as he c comes on his peripatetic journey. Like kings were wont to do in medieval times. They traveled from castle to castle of their kingdom. And they favored the locals with their presence. That's what Christ is going to do for all the kingdoms in eternity. He's constantly on a circuit. Visiting all of the sub-kingdoms. That's why he needs an entourage of 144,000 Jews. That's Revelation 14. That's why he needs it. You know, you got your thousand year stint down here. Where Christ rules the whole world. And then we, the church who got our kingdoms assigned to us during the tribulation. We end up ruling Gentile kingdoms down here so that Israel has, you know, rest from her enemies. She's queen of the nations, and we're the nation she's queen over. But we each have our own kingdoms down here. And we have some kind of kingdom off-world. Not sure what. Okay, what what's wrong with that picture? Why am I objecting to it? It gets me closer to Christ. Why would I ever want to object to that? So, that's the dilemma. It is my dream come true. And it is my worst nightmare to become this king person. Will I actually make it? I don't know. 50-50. And if I was betting on myself, I'd say 50-50 chance. Because this really bugs me. But obviously, as I've just proven to you, indicting myself, I have no excuse. I know this doctrine in my sleep.
and all my objections to it are irrational. Now, if you were to play this audio over and supplant the things I told you were my personal bugaboos and the advantages and God's answer to them, could you supplant, replace everything I personally said about myself with personal things in your life, your personal objections, your personal dreams come true, your personal pluses and minuses about what you think you know about your relationship with God and this kingship thing. That's what you should really do. Because most of episode 12 is going to be on role play. And this is the beginning of it. If you want to become king, you will be closer to Christ as a result. And I would imagine that's what you want more than anything. To hell with everything else. To hell with the goodies. To hell with the, you know, yeah, everything you ever wanted down here. You know, all the things you wish you had time to have. Or you didn't have the money or you didn't have the time or both to get down here. All the goodies you wanted to play with down here. You'll have them up there. But here's the catch. Once you get up there, they won't matter to you. The only thing you're going to want to do with whatever it is God gives you is spend it on Christ as an expression of doctrine about Him, as an expression of some way that you can give something to Him, to, you know, some kind of glamorous thing you can give to Him, and count on it, whatever God gives us up there, it will glorify Him. God isn't going to make, you know, fake presents for His Son. I can't imagine how good it must be. But it's going to have to be that good somehow. Okay, wouldn't you want that? Right down here, now. Don't you want that to be your outcome too? It can be. So replace everything I said about myself and my own personal problems and advantages with your own personal problems and advantages in growing up toward God and the spiritual life to kingship. Your objections to the idea of kingship, if you have any, or if you have objection to something else, well then there's something else. In other words, replace brain out, which is just another nickname for believer, derived from Ephesians 4.23. Replace this brain out, personal details, with your own. That was the objective of this audio. The winner is going to have a merge of his own dream come true and his own worst nightmare as a condition for finishing the course. Every believer in the Bible, that's what happened. Christ in particular, and especially. Worst nightmare? Well, hello, being imputed with sins. Dream come true? Pain for everybody on behalf of Father. Well, they were united in Him on the cross. So what do you think life is going to be for us? Most Christians, they never get that far, so they never know this ultimate purpose and design for your life. I may not make it either, but I'm in the final stretch. Whether I actually finish the course or not, I can't tell you. 50-50. Alright, so since we're coming up on 50 minutes, ask yourself, okay, let me take what Brain Out said and recast that, replace what Brain Out said about herself and put my own stuff in it. Put your own stuff in it. So that you, therefore, will have God's own forecast for your life. The way He wants it to go. Talk to Him about it. Use 1 John 1 9. Talk to God about it. Say, you know, how do I take what Brain Out said and replace her personal stuff with my personal stuff, Dad? do that and then you'll actually have a forecast a prophecy about how God wants your own life to go It'd be the most useful exercise you can ever engage in so now I'm coming up on 50 minutes so now I'm going to say peace out <laughs>